The following program is the work of the broadcast students at the British Columbia Institute of Technology. BCIT Magazine features news stories from around the Lower Mainland which were produced over the last week. Responsibility for the content of the show rests completely with the students and their instructors. Today on BCIT Magazine, a Vancouver group helps those with disabilities get out on the slopes. A high-flying new yoga trend is taking off in the Lower Mainland. And hundreds were treated to a blue carpet experience by the Vancouver Police Foundation. Welcome to BCIT Magazine. I'm Mariah Beaton. And I'm Melanie Booth. The BC Teachers Federation has called for a strike vote next week, saying the government has brought nothing to the table during recent contract negotiations. BCTF President Jim Eicher says the province still isn't offering to restore the class size and composition limits that were stripped from their contract in 2002. Teachers do not take job action lightly. We care deeply about our schools, about our students, and about our communities. But we cannot sit back and let Christy Clark and her government talk about labour peace in public while trying once again to provoke teachers behind closed doors. The strike vote will take place from the 4th to the 6th. The results will be announced on the evening of the 6th, though Eicher says teachers would not actually be going out on strike any time in the near future. That job action, if needed, will occur in stages, but any initial action will not include immediate school closures or disruptions for our students, nor will it have our teachers stop doing extracurricular activities, and it will not affect report cards or communication with parents. Eicher says that once a strike vote is taken, the union has 90 days to activate it with some sort of job action. The teachers and the government have been negotiating since before their contract expired last June. It may not have been the Oscars, but on Tuesday, some of Vancouver's most philanthropic personalities gathered at the Vancouver Convention Centre for Vancouver's Police Foundation's Night Patrol Gala. Jeff Clowers reports. Those in attendance at Tuesday's Night Patrol Gala got to walk the blue carpet before being a part of what was described as an experiential Vancouver Police Patrol experience. That meant displays of police transportation, some old and some new, even some that were living. On top of that, there was also the unique opportunity to get hands-on time with some of the department's gear. And while the event gave attendees the chance to rub elbows with some of Vancouver's finest, its main purpose was to raise money for the Vancouver Police Foundation's essential services and community outreach programs. The foundation helps with many different projects, including equipment that we need. For example, the foundation purchased an armored rescue vehicle for us. They also purchased a mobile command center. And it turns out both vehicles were supposed to be here tonight but they called away to a, a situation in the field, a serious call over in West Vancouver, so they're deployed out in the field right now. What made this year's gala different from those in the past was the celebration of the Vancouver Police Pipe Band's 100th anniversary. As a part of reaching the momentous milestone, the band had the opportunity to perform with a famous Canadian singer. Our pipe band are tremendous ambassadors, not only for the police department, but for the city of Vancouver and for the country of Canada. Uh, many people have seen them in civic events, but they also perform elsewhere in the country, around the world. And uh, we're celebrating a special night tonight. They get to perform a song with the uh, uh, Sarah McLaughlin, and they're really excited about doing that. With over 800 guests in attendance, including Premier Christy Clark and Vancouver Mayor Gregor Robertson, the event definitely followed through on its promise of a star-studded affair. Jeff Clowers in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Vancouver Adaptive Snow Sports has been offering ski and snowboard programs at Grouse Mountain for people with disabilities since 1974. They held an event on the mountain to show off what some of their skiers can do. Our reporter Sook Pirawal has the details from the top of Grouse Mountain. Ian Hickenbotham is a 62-year-old skier, but he doesn't ski in the usual way. After going through some serious medical problems, Hickenbotham now uses a sit-ski and uh, ran into a bunch of uh, orthopedic and neurological problems and surgeries and 
um, was unable to ski anymore as of about five years ago. And last year, somebody pointed me in the direction of bass. Well, the sit ski's fun. Um, it was a bit of a learning curve. President of Vancouver Adaptive Snow Sports, Ann Bethune, says she thinks Hickenbotham's life has changed for the better since he learned how to sit ski. To see him jump into the sit ski last year and have immediate success was incredible. And I know that it would, personally it had been a challenging few years for him physically. And to feel that sense of freedom and movement and speed that sit skiing allowed him to do was, I think, just absolutely incredible. And definitely his life's been changed and he's, he's part of our community. Many of the instructors involved with adaptive sports started off as students themselves and are now teaching others. Richard Chan is one of those who is now giving back. I lost my leg in quite a while ago, right? In, I think in 94 due to an infection. And now I ski on a prosthetic limb. Uh, but I volunteer to teach other people to ski, to, to give back to the program because the program is important. Vancouver Adaptive Snow Sports will be holding its annual fundraiser next month on Grouse. Sook Perawalt in North Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. The Winter Olympics just wrapped up in Sochi and Canada was very successful. We now bring in our reporter Sook Perawalt. Sook, just how well did Canada fare at the Games? Yeah, we fared quite well. We won 25 medals. That's down from 26 that we had in Vancouver. The gold medals were also down. We just won 10 of those after a record setting 14 in 2010. We also left a couple medals on the table, namely in short track speed skating. Charles Amlan won just one of the four events that he was in. And perhaps the most surprising was him not meddling in the 500 meter, the event that he won in 2010. And what are some of your favorite moments? Yeah, there's a lot that come to mind. Gilmore Jr. giving up his spot in speed skating to Denny Morrison, who would go on to win silver. Alexander Bilodeau repeating as Mogul's champion. The Dufour LaPointe sisters getting on the podium together. But I think my favorite memory was the women's gold medal game. It was an incredible game. It was an incredible comeback. And it's always fun to beat the Americans. Back to you. Thanks, Sook. What do you get when you mix a hammock, Cirque du Soleil-like acrobatics, and yoga? I went to a brand new yoga studio in Coquitlam to find out. This is what the yoga position, the pigeon, looks like on the floor. Now, this is what the same position looks like in the air. Just last month, the owners at Gravity Yoga brought the high-flying new yoga trend, aerial yoga, to Coquitlam. I tried aerial yoga about a year ago uh, when we started thinking of opening a studio. There's certainly a lot more challenge in the aerial practice, just letting go of more fear because you have to trust that fabric that is holding you up. Super fun. Yeah, it's really challenging. It's really different. Um, you get an opening that you, you just can't get on the floor. Aerial yoga uses traditional yoga poses combined with Pilates and aerial aerobics. The twist, every pose incorporates a silk hammock hanging from the ceiling. There's not a lot of pressure in your body because the hammock kind of holds you. So yeah, you can get an opening on a safer level. So when you're upside down and your hips are being held in air, you can completely release mm -hmm. the spine if you can relax. And the ladies at Gravity Yoga say that many yogis are having fun with this new practice. When they finally can let go enough to go upside down, there's usually a big smile, lots of laughter. Just, I think that feeling of, oh my God, I'm a kid again. You know, most people haven't gone upside down since they were a kid, you know. So you got a 50 or 60 year old person in here and they go upside down. It's like a huge smile on their face. They're laughing, lots of giggles. It's great. Well, it seems like a workout that will be hanging around for a long time. Mariah Beaton in Coquitlam for BCIT Magazine. <laughs> Coming up next on BCIT Magazine, Burnaby Pet Store owners face a new bylaw, and a downtown Eastside coffee shop is giving back to the community. I chose BCIT because I know that all the programs are very hands-on. We have our own radio station, like it's, 
It's one of the best programs that I've ever heard of. I am starting a job on Monday, so confidence is high. Uh, honestly, I didn't think it was going to be this fun. A defining moment for me was when I finished my first internship and got lots of really great feedback from industry professionals. I would never imagine I'd be walking into the floors of TSN and thinking, I'm not a student anymore, I'm here to work. I will be starting a job with an investigative news program in Toronto and I'm really excited to see that grow into what will become hopefully my dream job. BCIT broadcast and online journalism, putting you to work. A new bylaw in Burnaby forces pet store owners to sterilize cats before they're sold to their new owners. While this is good news to many pet advocates in the city, some shelters are voicing their concerns. Jillian Stead explains. These cute cats are among the thousands in Burnaby who have been fixed as part of a new municipal bylaw. The new law requires all cats sold in the city to undergo sterilization before they're sold in pet stores. This should come as good news to those who manage cat shelters, but rescuer Nikki Forbes, who runs a shelter out of her home, isn't too keen on the new motion. Personally, I don't agree with it. She says that the idea to spay or neuter is a good one to prevent unwanted pregnancies, but Forbes says imposing mandatory ages on when the surgery occurs can have a negative impact on the animal. Taken away from its siblings, now you're sticking it on a surgery table removing its, you know, female parts, sewing it back up and hoping that it's okay. The bylaw, however, has been written to address the concerns of those who share the same views as Forbes. Councillor Sav Dollywall says council consulted with local veterinarians and they too couldn't agree on an appropriate age in which to spay or neuter. And if they are not of the right age, which sometimes could be three months to six months, uh, there's a differing opinion, they would issue a certificate to the buyer. Other shelters like the Burnaby SPCA welcome the bylaw. The association has always made sterilization mandatory before adoption, and unlike Forbes, the SPCA supports sterilizing kittens because it ensures the animals will leave the shelter sterile. Ryan Butelainen says that if the animal isn't fit for the surgery, then a voucher will be issued. There's only one little exception where the animal may be too small or too young to be spayed and neutered, where we'll give out a voucher, but other than that, every single animal that leaves our doors, uh, cat, rabbit and dog, are all spayed and neutered before they leave. Regardless of opinion of when sterilization can humanely occur, most agree that the bylaw would deter people from buying pets in stores as the price would likely rise. This is because the onus is now on the store owner to cover the expense of veterinary costs, making it cheaper to adopt than to buy. Dollywall says the amendment gives store owners a chance to educate buyers, which would perhaps prevent impulse buys. Well, let's give them this opportunity to fill up their socks in terms of treating the animals that they're going to sell. If Burnaby's abandoned cat problem persists, he says council will consider an outright ban on in-store pet sales. Jillian Stead in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. With the changes to pet sale bylaws in Burnaby, many people may be looking at adopting when it's time to pick out their next pet. A Burnaby pet store and a local rescue society teamed up to host a pet adoption event. Our reporter Kelsey Furlong was there. It was a busy day at Mutton Moggy, a pet food store in Burnaby. More than 100 people came out to attend the pet adoption event that they hosted in partnership with Home Finders Animal Rescue. They have brought um, some animals on site for um, an adoption event, a pet adoption day. So we've got some turtles on site and a little baby kitten and an old lady cat and a couple of huskies that need homes. We've got a really great um, adoption application for the little kitten um, that's here. He's eight and a half weeks old. Um, and we had another family come in that was really interested in uh, one of the turtles. So that's really awesome. Hillary Wilson coordinated the event. It's good for the animals to have them out meeting people. It's really great for people to come in and be able to see, because we don't have a shelter, so it's easier for people to come in and meet animals rather than have to set up an appointment time to come by. This is Shammy. Shammy came through Coquitlam Animal Control. He was found wandering down the side of the road. Many families came in to see the animals, and it seems like a couple of them may have found homes. I think we actually have a home for Shammy, and I think we have a home for our kitten. 
and we have some interest in some fostering for some of our senior cats, which is the best thing ever. Fosters are an important part of home finders as they do not have a permanent shelter. Rosa Rizanzoff was on site trying to find a home for the two dogs that she's currently fostering. They are Alaskan Huskies, they're brother and sister, they're both nine years old. Um, and they were an owner surrender, unfortunately they couldn't take care of them anymore. Rizanzoff has fostered five other dogs before these two. So like if you're a big animal person, it's so wonderful, like what what you give to them, they give back to you in like tenfold. This is the first event of this kind that Mutt and Moggy has hosted, but it certainly won't be the last. Kelsey Furlong in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. We're now joined by our reporter Kelsey Furlong. Kelsey, what do people need to know if they're interested in adopting an animal? What's involved in the adoption process? Well, any reputable rescue organization will make you fill out an application form, so you can't expect to walk out with a pet on the same day. Um, there will also be some sort of home check involved, so they'll come to your house, they'll ask you a whole bunch of questions, and they'll see what kind of environment the animal is actually going to be living in. Um, the final aspect of a reput reputable agency is that they will actually guarantee the pet for life. So if at some point you find you're not able to take care of the pet anymore, you have to get rid of it for some reason, whether it's one month after you adopt or five years after you adopt, they will take the animal back and find a new home. Kelsey, is there one type of animal that the Home Finders Animal Rescue focuses on? Yeah, well of course there are always cats and dogs looking for homes. But this rescue agency in particular focuses on turtles. Because of the fact that people don't realize how big turtles grow, um, and they can also live to be around 50 years, um, there are a lot of abandoned turtles in the Lower Mainland. So they focus on them, they take them in, um, and if anyone out there is looking for a long-term pet, they should definitely consider adopting a turtle. Back to you. Winter made a late return to the Lower Mainland earlier this week. Students at BCIT had to deal with snow on campus for the first time this winter. Campus security is telling students to be cautious any time the white stuff makes an appearance. We do comment that, you know, be prepared, wear proper shoes, wear proper clothing, you know, have a kit in your vehicle if you're going to be uh, driving and uh, just take your time. Despite being pretty to look at, student reaction to the snow was mixed with many raising concerns over the snowfall. Maybe not driving in it, but uh, it's pretty nice. It's really nice to look at, that's for sure, but not, not fun to drive in, though, that's for sure. Snow didn't have any effect on classes at the Burnaby campus. Coming up next on BCIT Magazine, one Vancouver man is meeting a new stranger every day. And a local lingerie line is helping African girls to stay in school. The most rewarding thing for me has been the relationships I developed in the program, both with instructors and classmates. My sense of confidence has never, never been higher. I mean, this, this program has offered great opportunities to be in real world, real industry situations, and, and being in those moments and knowing I can contribute, I can do this. It's exciting to be in this industry and to meet lots of great people and to make amazing friends. BCIT broadcasts and online journalism, realizing your potential. Standby graphics, ready camera one. If you want to experience the fast-paced world of news, today on BCIT Magazine, striking. Make magic on a movie set, frame, and action. Or bring your creative ideas to life. BCIT's hands-on training will get you started. BCIT Television and Video Production. Your possibilities start here. Oh, hi. Many of you may remember Bob Ross as the man who brought us his joy of painting. Well, now he's the subject of a new exhibit in Vancouver called Happy Little Clouds. Submissions are open to anyone, regardless of their skill level, as long as the pieces have something to do with the subject. It runs until March 23rd. Fresh bread, soft German pretzels, butter croissants, chocolate croissants, cupcakes, carbs. If those words made your mouth water, I've got some good news for you. The Baker's Market is back. Every weekend, you'll find your fellow carb lovers indulging in some of the best baked goods the city has to offer. So, go grab a bite. 
You've got until May 4th. What do an astronaut, a primologist, a former FBI agent, a journalist, and the woman who inspired Sandra Bullock in The Blind Side all have in common? Probably not a lot. But it's their unique lives and experiences that are bringing together people like Chris Hadfield and Jane Goodall for a five-part lecture series at the Orpheum Theatre. Go to uniquelives.com for speaker dates. I'm Jen Hazel, and this has been your BCIT Community Calendar. Since opening a year ago, a new coffee shop in the downtown east side is trying to make their Mondays matter. My co-anchor Mariah Beaton visited the cafe to see what it's all about. On the outside, this looks like a normal cafe. But on the inside, it's filled with people who are giving back to their community. We're in the area that we're in. We're in the downtown east side, which is known to be one of the poorest postal codes in, in North America and definitely in Canada. So I think, um, I think any business that comes into this area has a responsibility to do, do something. And do something he has. Ever since Ryan opened Lost and Found Cafe one year ago, he's been handing out leftover pastries and donating Monday morning coffee sales to downtown Eastside Charities. Um, so it's nice for a customer to come in and have a coffee and chat to the owners and know that you know, stuff's going back to the community or helping someone. I think the downtown Eastside could always benefit from um, little charities like this and it adds the sense of community down here. On average, the cafe has donated approximately $2,000 a month to charities that help the community. And this is a great community. It's really, it's, it's, it's I mean, it's troubled. There's tons of struggle and, and mental illness and drug abuse, but there's, there's also real beauty in the, in the community as well. Ryan hopes the community continues to come to his cafe and add a little beauty to their Monday mornings. Mariah Beaton in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. A local lingerie line is making it their mission to help African girls stay in school. My co-anchor Melanie Booth found out more about how they're helping out. Christina Norman and Laura Kerr have found a unique way to empower young women in Africa by providing them with underwear. By selling these beautiful pieces of lingerie, they're getting closer and closer to reaching their goal. So we make all of our underwear here. It's luxury underwear. It's made and designed in Vancouver, and all of our profits from revenue go to me establishing a sewing center in Kitwe, Zambia. After spending a year in Zambia, Kerr was excited to jump on board with the project. Designing this luxury underwear here in Vancouver was inspired when the two found out how many young African girls drop out of school every year. This is simply because they don't have the proper underwear to menstruate in. You know, that's the motivation. It's not about us at all. Like, you totally just separate that from us. It's about the girls and it's about making a difference in individual girls' lives because that's what we're all about. And when you focus on that, I mean, I'm sewing each pair of underwear by hand right now and it's just, I mean, so much love is going into it and you're thinking about the girls and it's just, it's, you, you, it's totally not about us and it's awesome. Norman says women can help out just by addressing that this actually is an issue. It's really incredible the power that comes through within women when we just realize the, this issue and it's really, really silly. It's a really silly issue to have underwear, have any sort of power in a young girl's life. While the two are keeping busy managing you and her lingerie on this side of the world, they have a trip planned to Zambia in September. The sewing centre is expected to be up and running by then, which won't only provide underwear for the girls, but also jobs. I just smile just thinking about giving a girl a pair of underwear. I'm just so excited. You know, it's something we've been dreaming about every single day here. And it's just, it's, it's, it's going to be mind-blowing to see her smile and say thank you and just give you a hug. And you're just, this eight-year-old girl is going to be able to continue school and graduate and maybe go to college just because of a couple of pairs of underwear. Man, that's just it's crazy. It just blows my mind. It's so rad. I love it. You and her lingerie is hoping to raise $10,000 total to put towards the sewing center in Zambia. Melanie Booth in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. A Vancouver man is tackling the city's unfriendly reputation. His goal? To make a new friend every day for the rest of the year. And as I found out, his project seems to be going quite well. This is a pretty normal sight for Vancouver. Not much conversation between strangers and everyone is glued to their phone. But one Vancouverite has made it his goal to meet and talk to a new stranger every day. He's calling it the Stranger Project. I had been thinking a lot about uh, 
social connections. I've been a big people watcher for a long time. I enjoy sitting around uh, coffee shops and watching the world go by and kind of figuring out people and what's their story and what are they doing and what's their background. Easton approaches someone new every day and explains to them what his project is. He says for the most part, people are very open to sharing their stories. No, you know what, I'm totally overwhelmed by how much positive uh, response and reaction. Uh, it's really cool, people are sending me messages saying I'm starting to speak to people that I don't know on the street, or I'm thinking about people that I see on the street differently because of the Stranger Project. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely overwhelming. It, it really, uh, I've always had faith in humanity, but this definitely has reinstilled that faith in humanity without a doubt. Easton sometimes spends hours speaking with his new friends to learn more about them. He has been told his non-threatening approach is what helps people feel comfortable to speak freely. He had a friendly face, so we were able to strike up a conversation quite easily. Easton says some of the connections he's made with the strangers have turned into friendships, and he thinks everyone should give it a try. I encourage everybody just to, to reach out to that person next to them, talk about more than the weather, have a conversation with them, find out something about that person. I think that uh, individuals would be really amazed at how easy it is, um, but also how good it feels. Every stranger Easton meets has their photo taken. That and their story is shared on the Stranger Project 2014's Facebook page. Melanie Booth in Vancouver for BCAT Magazine. The ratings are in, and so is Seth Meyers. The first episode of the new host Late Night Show averaged 3.4 million viewers. With a 1.4 rating in the 18 to 49 demographic, it's the best rating for Monday Late Night Television in almost a decade. Meyers may have benefited from a visit by Vice President Joe Biden. First, there was the Real Housewives of Vancouver, then a casting call for the Real Hipsters of Vancouver. Plans are now in the works to develop a new reality show featuring one of Vancouver's most famous locations, Rec Beach. Patrons of the beach are being asked to send in audition videos, and creativity is encouraged. If you have any questions or comments regarding this program, please visit us online at bcit-broadcast.com or bcitbroadcastnews.ca. I'm Melanie Booth. And I'm Mariah Beaton. And that's today's BCIT Magazine. Thanks for watching. We leave you now with a look at some more gravity-defying aerial yoga.